Welcome to another edition of the Dental Today podcast. Thank you for stopping by. This is brought to you by Lab Media TV. My name is Hezekiah Morales, and here we go. Remember to follow us on social media at Lab Media TV. This last February in Chicago during LMT's Lab Day, I had the opportunity to visit with a dental technician professional at his lab located at the heart of Chicago. Once back from Chicago, I realized I had technical issues with the footage. Thankfully, we were able to recover all this footage, and now I hope you enjoy this two-part phenomenal interview with Mr. Oliver Trick. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the Dental Today podcast. We are uh, here in Chicago, the heart of Chicago, with an amazing person more than anything, and a great a dental professional, over 30 years of experience. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Mr. Oliver Trick. Oliver, welcome to the show. No, thank you. Welcome to the laboratory. Thank, thank you, you for having welcome. us. It's exciting thank you. Uh, to be here in Chicago. And uh, you opening your doors for us to come in and, and sit down and speak with you. A beautiful atmosphere. Of course. My How- pleasure, my honor to be uh, you know, among your list of guests, of technicians you want to uh, interview. So thank you for making the time. You know, welcome. And you brought the sun from the, <laughs> from the south, being, yeah. We don't always have this weather. <laughs> usually, usually people from the show, they can witness. They come to Chicago with big jackets and scarves, and yeah. they're always ready for snow. And some years we have a foot of snow during the show. But it's almost spring today. So it yeah. looks beautiful yeah, we're today. Lucky. And I think that it's a, one of the beautiful things about, about the... Uh, what I've experienced, at least, yeah. in the dental industry, specifically with dental technician professionals, is such a warm feeling and such a welcoming feeling uh, for people to share what they know and their journey. And that's why we're here. And yeah, welcome to the profession because we have, you know, you just for uh, how long now? Two years? Two, three years? I've been, uh, I've been with, um, with selling products about five years. So that's, that's pretty much how, how, how long I've been, I've been in touch with the dental industry, let's say that. But you've been all here in this location for only about only a year. Only a year, yes, 12 months now, because we had the inauguration uh, just before, or during the, meet, the meeting last year. Yeah? yeah. And our friend Elvis, I, I call him Elvis, Elvin. <laughs> <laughs> He's a superstar. I know, I know. For me, it's Elvis Presley. <laughs> I always tell him Elvis. But Elvin, you know, thank you. Thank you, Elvin. Where are you? Thank you. Absolutely. So, yeah. And before here, Chicago, where were you? We were in the suburb of Chicago, okay. and uh, we understood that being in the heart of Chicago was important to be accessible, to be present here and reachable for patients to come to visit. That, uh, for us, was important to make the move. So we were in a very, very cute little town, safe, about 25 minutes away from here. But, you know, people from the city like to stay in the city. So we wanted to be a part of that. You know, there is more action here. More, it's more dynamic, and uh, so the move was important to us. So we've been here for a year, and it was a great decision. Wow, and uh, uh, you've been in the industry for over 30 years. We, yes. You're talking about, you, you started when you were in your teens. I you was 16, a, yes. You weren't even an adult yet. No. How did this happen? You, you start working at 16 uh, at a high level of expectation and standards. How did this all happen? I always say I come from, uh, you know, the best university in the world, and that defines me well, and I'm not coming from the best university. My university or my school was an average school. You know, people get impressed or intimidated by it because, you know, France and Europe, but the school was the same level than any school you have here in this country. The best university in the world is passion. So I was a passionate technician from day one. And, you know, it was my parents' friend had a lab, and I was not uh, supposed to become a dental technician. I was supposed to become an architect. Mm-hmm. So I had my, uh, I applied to school, and I was supposed to start in September. My, my father always, you know, strict. He said, you're not going to have a summer off doing nothing. We'll find you a job. So they sent me to the lab to uh, work, to do model work or learn or observe at least. But they wanted to make me work a little bit to, uh, you know, to keep me busy. Uh, but I liked it, and I never left there. I worked with them five years. So I never went to the school to become an architect. So we were doing, I was an apprentice at 16, and so I was doing part-time school, part-time the lab. But my passion, you know, 
uh, took over. And uh, yes, I worked with them five years. And from then, there I worked for dental offices. Uh, and then I really learned a lot because I was exposed to patients. I was exposed to my work clinically. So I was seeing the, the patients before, during, and after treatment. Mm -hmm. And that was the best. The best for me. I've learned so much. And from there, I moved to the States um, 20 years ago already, 22 years ago. Wow. For this profession. You know, I had a great opportunity to work for a great prosthodontist on the East Coast in Maine. So I worked there, uh, and I opened my lab in 2002 in Chicago. Wow. So time flies, you know. 30 years after, you know, 30 years of dentistry and 20 years in the States. So from the beginning of your, let's call it career, yeah. you've, all, you've always had that connection with the patient. Am I understanding that correctly? For the first five years as an apprentice, uh, very little. You know, it was a regular laboratory, like, uh, you know, the traditional lab, kind of hidden, which is the past, you know. Right. Uh, a great lab, and um, today, doing high quality at least, is involved with patients. And for that, you have to be close to an office or being able to have them here. Hmm. Patients, they know this address now. They come from far, and I'm lucky. But the first five years, no, regular laboratory, regular uh, encounter with patients or contact with patients, so rarely, I would say. And if we wanted to see them, we had to go to the office, but this is not convenient. Mm. Offices were close uh, to the lab, but, you know, in, uh, in France, you know, you have traffic, you have, you know, it's an old city, old towns, so it takes, it takes a long time sometimes. So the first five years now was not uh, seeing patients often. It was more traditional laboratory. But after that, working in the dental office, yes, patients every day, daily, and that, uh, we're talking about 95, 1995. So for the past, what is that, 25 years, yes, patients every day. And wow. that makes a difference because my level increased, obviously. You are confronted to reality. And um, it increased because you see your work being not as perfect as you thought it was. But also, there is direct communication. So your work, obviously, gets better and better because... You get more precise. You really do custom work to each individual. Each, each patient is requiring something slightly different. And so you adapt to uh, fulfill their needs. And that's very fulfilling, fulfilling my, my expectation and my standards. So fulfilling the need of the patient is yeah. always at the forefront of a dental technician, obviously, because... Uh, be just because a piece is aesthetic is not necessarily functional. It's not yeah, necessarily... Exactly. There's the nothing right more customized. Nothing more customized than a, a veneer or a crown. Nothing. If you have money, you buy a Ferrari. It's not that customized. It's the same car than the next car. Just the color, maybe the, the leather, the seat is going to be slightly different. They are the same cars. All sorts of the same. Those tables. I paid a lot of money for this table. Supposedly it was custom made. Ask, it was custom made. Ask them to put a drawer. They don't want to. They can't. And I pick the color and everything. But the tooth is, is nothing more unique than a tooth. Patients have to understand that. That's why it's supposed to. It should cost more money. And that's important. The money part is important. And that, that For some people, it's, very, it's a taboo topic. Right. But it's very important because the value of it is incredible. And people don't know that, and they should. And that's, thank, that's an opportunity for patients to get to know us yes. and to get to appreciate what we do. So for a long time, at the very yeah. least here in the United States, the public doesn't know. Or Nowhere, very anywhere. Or little understanding anywhere, all around of the world. what a dental technician yeah. professional is. All around the world. It's a common problem. You know, I've, I've, um, I've traveled a lot. I have the opportunity to teach and be exposed. All over the world. Oh, almost. I mean, many countries, yes, for sure. And I'm telling you, it's the same problem and the same story everywhere. Dental technicians are always, you know, hidden. Yes, yes. But, you know, we have a beautiful trade. And I always compare to other trades or other, um, other professions. If you go to a restaurant, the chef is not hidden. It's open kitchen concept. And that's why we designed the laboratory like that. The chef is not hidden. You don't have just a waiter... And assuming the waiter cooked, no, you know there is a chef behind. But patients assume, whatever, the dentist made it. 
or barber. They don't know there is a dental technician, that they should. You said they should. Now, th there could be many conversations to be had as to why they should. So I, I want to go and, and shift gears here and ask you about a conversation that I had with a dental technician a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Because the patient does not know, does not see where the work is coming from, Yes. that can leave the doctor, the dentist, to send that work somewhere else where it's not necessarily at the highest standards. Correct. So what is your response to that? but specifically for the dental technician. How can the dental technician make themselves marketable as you've done so that the public can know that they are there and what they do? What, what would be your answer to that? Well, they should be um, um, educated, first of all, themselves. They should be able to have a conversation, explain to a patient uh, why and how, which material they use and why. And that would, uh, I think, would be an asset for dentists. They would, that's an asset for my clients. They love to send me patients here. And I charge money for a visit. But they still want to send more patients because they know there is an extra professional in the team who knows what he's talking about, who is passionate about making smiles and making beautiful and precise and functional smiles. So they send patients here. I'm only an asset in the team. I... I'm the person also who helps them justify a high price tag, period. So technicians should get educated. They should make an effort to have a clean lab, a clean space. doesn't have to be fancy, but nice, organized, and, and clean, where you can host and have, you know, open the door and have a patient over and share your passion. Tell them this is how we do it. Hmm. You know, it's not pre-made and prefabricated. We make it by hand, you know, with our, all our knowledge. And we start with water and powder and water. I have patients looking over my shoulder all the time, and they're amazed. They're impressed. Wow. Yeah, so, yes, it's, it's important. So the conversation, again, you said the conversation of money is, it can be a taboo for some. But I believe it's a conversation that may not be had enough because there, there, are, there are certain, let's call them dental technicians, that let's just say they have a limited understanding of the full spectrum. They are, they are afraid. They live with fear. Technicians today live with fear. A fear of what? Fear of losing a doctor. Hmm. And if you do the math, a doctor should fear to lose his technician. Because, and I know it sounds arrogant, but it's the truth. Do make the math. Do the math. Do the math. Make the, the, you know, do the calculation. It is incredible. I mean, how many great technicians you have in this country? I know 20, 25, 30. There's 50, 50 states, 320 million people out there. I don't know the number of doctors, but you know there are plenty of doctors. And if doctors don't work well with us and don't respect us, why would I bother? You know, there's plenty. I have the opportunity to have a wailing list of doctors. So I only take the people I enjoy working with. Not the best, the best people. You know, the best professional, the ones who respect us, who really work for their patients and who are, you know, treat, treating us as a team member. And those doctors are good. So technicians shouldn't be afraid because there are more dentists out there. So to, to address a dental technician that has his own laboratory yes. but lives in this fear that you're talking about of possibly changing his price structure but is afraid to lose a doctor, what would you tell that technician? Well, make sure you're needed. You know, you become um, important in the team. If we have, I mean, we know, and I'm not very good at sending the work on time. This is not something I have been able to do because I'm always busy, I'm always behind. But, you know, if you become so important in the team, the rehabilitation team, there's no price for good work, reliable, on time, precise, you know. There's no price for that. There, there's a lot of money in this country, in this world. There's enough patients who can pay our price, to be honest with you. Look at people, they go to hotels, five, six hundred dollars a night. Why can they pay a tooth who's going to last 20 years, six hundred dollars to the technician? Why not? So you believe it's more so 
the education to the dental technician professional yeah. to understand their value if they in don't the life of the patient. Correct. And if they don't stay hidden, if they expose themselves the way I did, and I was already exposed, to be honest with you, I had publications, I had already had an Instagram account, a Facebook account, I was already lecturing around the world, but physically, I wanted to be in a space like this one, to be able to you know, open the door and I have them here and explain what I do. Because if you do that, they know you exist and they are willing to pay the price. You know how many patients call me here directly. and directly and I have to... Is that forbidden? No, it's not forbidden. I don't practice dentistry without a license. I look at them, I say, you know what? I can work with this and this and this doctor. Pick one and I'll make you smile. But acting like this and having this opportunity to refer them to a dentist, a doctor, a postal dentist. My price is respected. I have actually increased my price that way of 10% from 10 years ago because if I maintain the, uh, the traditional order, if a doctor sends a case to me, I have to lower my fee because we are actually affected by cat cam technology. Mm. You know, the price went down. The average price for a crown went down. But nobody should be surprised if they close down the shop because if my rent is more expensive, if the, the price of the porcelain is more expensive, and they are, if everything increases, but your price, your sale price, the price of your crown is lower, you go straight to bankruptcy. It's very simple. You spend more money, you make less money. We don't get younger. To be honest with you, I don't want to work 80 hours, 80 hours a week anymore. I used to. Today, I want to work 40 like everybody else. I want to have Wednesday afternoon off, like most dentists. Why not a technician? I was listening to a conversation by uh, Patrick Bet David, who is uh, a mentor in business. Yes. And one of the things that he said that is really connecting with what you just said is for 2020, try to find a way of generate, generating your own leads so that you can become valuable. And it seems to me like that's the system that you've really developed here where you have opened your doors to create leads that then become possible patients. You refer them and then the doctors say, you know what? A lab, you want you want to charge me less, uh, or you want you want uh, less money for your work? It's fine. I don't need you because I have a person that is part of my practice, part of my team. But so there are a lot of people that, because of social media and you know the the traditional media, they look at the people that are lecturing and the people mm -hmm. that are uh, being invited everywhere like they're on Mount Olympus, they're gods yes. on another level. But what would you say to somebody to begin their transition from a traditional dental laboratorist, let's just say that, that is still in the rat race per se and has not made the transition? What would you tell them? To be educated, I think that was my first answer earlier before meeting patients here or there in their laboratory. They have to be educated. They have to understand different materials with their physical properties or optical properties. That's important. That's how you become an important part of the team. Doctors don't know everything. They are very knowledgeable. They have a degree. Um, they have no question. I mean, I respect them. But uh, they don't know everything. You can't know everything. I think it's our responsibility to know what we use, what we are going to give to the doctor to place in the mouth. So I know material very well. You know, and I'm interested. I keep learning. I mean, I read. I, uh, I attend lectures. I want to know materials. And I... When somebody knows more than me, you know, I question. Like Zirconia, for example, I have not been interested to work with Zirconia. But I have a friend of mine who is um, um, very knowledgeable, so I'm listening and I'm, uh, I'm interested because some situations I may need this material. But I'm very versatile. I work a lot with uh, metal, uh, with porcelain fused to metal or lithium disilicate, or one of my um, specialties. Uh, porcelain veneers and refractory. So this is important also to master, you know, a few type of restoration so you become an expert, you become the best at it. So 
So you're knowledgeable education, yes. Education. And then doctors, they seek for that level and they come to you. Absolutely. Because they don't have to do their homework on that. They can rely on you Absolutely. To, do, to be the professional that exactly. they need you to do to complete exactly. the restoration, the smile. That's, that's We're amazing. not there just to take an order and, and perform and apply what they have been asking. No, we participate. You know, They ask often, what do you think, Olivier? What material should we use for that? This is a situation. So they obviously update me with the condition of the patient. And, you know, I have my experience. Yeah, I'm very happy to participate and give advice. At the end, they pay for it. So obviously they place an order. But, you know, my, my knowledge is an important aspect. It plays an important role there in, my, uh, in the demand I have. So in other words, it also sounds to me like your sales strategy is more of a consultative Absolutely. From a cons consultative point of view, because you don't sell your product uh, just by a price. You no. sell your product by what you can offer in That's terms a service, of yeah. experience, in terms of knowledge, and what you just mentioned, which is very, very important, by keeping up with the new materials that are coming exactly. out, and how to marry the different, as you mentioned, the different patients and the different needs. So that leads me to, to the next topic here. I, I, I'm looking at the beautiful lab that you have here, and it's amazing what you mentioned, you. that it's such an open concept to open the door so that people can see the art and the and the knowledge that goes into that. But I don't see CADCAM. Please, share a little bit on your perspective and, and your experience up to this point and why you've decided to stay in the lane where you are? Well, CATCAM was uh, developed to uh, compensate the lack of education. You know, people don't get trained. So for me, having 30 years of experience, why would I use a CATCAM machine that is going to actually limit me? So it's going to enhance the work of somebody with very little experience because they have beautiful libraries of teeth in the software or in the memory or in the system. But when you have the knowledge and the experience, there's no need to go down, you know. For them, for people who no experience, is such an asset, no question. Wow. But also, you know, you have those impressions, uh, you know, scanner now. Mm -hmm. But we have to know why it's developed. It's developed to avoid taking an impression, pouring it, placing it in a box, sending it to FedEx, and then Federal Express is putting on the plane all the way to Shanghai, and then over there, there's a technician who reopens it. No, we've, by pressing enter after you scan, it's directly being printed in China or somewhere else. But very often, I mean, there's a big, large part of the production of the United States that is being sent overseas. So they develop scanners for that reason. And, and I can know? demonstrate that I have during my lectures over and over that precision is obviously very poor compared to a beautiful PVS impression. Mm. Unfortunately, you know, the need of people, we have the tendency to uh, compromise the quality, to go faster and being cheaper. But in this laboratory, the goal is to go higher and higher in level, in quality. So obviously, CATCAM doesn't have its place. Not today. Maybe in the future. But not today, no. We are a boutique, a real boutique laboratory. You know, we do things by hand. We do things extremely precisely. And uh, we know we offer the best. We want to be the best laboratory in the world. That's my goal. So if I'm understanding this correctly, you, st you believe that, uh, let's call it CAD CAM, is, has its place. But you do believe it's a downgrade. At this point in time, it's a downgrade. For somebody like me. For somebody that has the experience. Of course. And the knowledge. Of course. To produce, as you mentioned, not only higher aesthetics, but higher standard of, of rendering a, of a product in the mouth. With the of course. And to use CAD CAM technology, you have to use, you know, you have to mill. What can you mill with? with, your, with um, what can you mill with those type of machines? Zircon. Okay. If you mill a piece of lithium desilicate, the quality is actually not as good as if you press it. So pressing and milling is two different ways to achieve you know, the final result. Pressing requires a little more knowledge because you have to wax it, you have to invest it, you have to create a mold. And uh, when I'm educating you a little bit, most people who are watching us understand that. 
but the piece the same framework in lithium D silica, same material, is going to be a higher quality if it's pressed rather than milled. So the milling machine, even for the same framework, it's better if you make made, made it by hand instead of milling. So even for that, the milling machine doesn't have.